Today I'll be presenting compact instruments and instrument suites for future small satellite opportunities in cislunar space and beyond. I'm Pamela Clark from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I've listed the names of folks whose instruments I'll be discussing during the course of the talk on the title slide. As part of the Lunar Initiative, through programs such as NASA's DALI, Simplex, CLIPS, and PRISM, NASA and collaborators have been developing diverse instruments, as well as high-performance, generic, yet reconfigurable packaging for extreme environments, such as the lunar surface. Versions of these instruments discussed here are CubeSat or SmallSat scale and suitable for orbiter, stationary, or mobile lunar surface platforms. Also presented are several examples of suites which utilize these instruments and are capable of delivering focused yet high priority measurements on mobile platforms. High priority lunar science objectives relevant here include determining the global distribution and origin as well as inventory for water and other potential in situ resources at local scale, monitoring and modeling the range of interactions between radiation, charged particles, exosphere, micrometeorite, surface and subsurface constituting the lunar environment, especially in areas around the morphological and illumination boundaries associated with persistently shadowed regions, and monitoring and modeling the lunar interior to constrain the moon's history and origin in areas likely to reveal lunar volcano tectonic or bombardment history. This is an eye chart included for your reference that shows the relationship between planetary community most recent decadal survey high priority goals from which the objectives are derived, the kinds of measurements that are needed to support these goals and the instruments that are required to take those measurements. And you'll see there's a very broad range of instruments Compact versions are available for many, and examples over on the right-hand side. Please peruse this at your leisure. The idea of putting in-situ monitors on the lunar surface at various stations is not new. This is an example of instruments deployed from the Apollo missions. And again, compact versions of these instruments, many of them are now available, and of course included things like the heat flow experiment, solar wind particle analyzers, uh, magnetometers, seismic experiments, and uh, lunar atmosphere composition experiments. I'd like to describe several groups of instruments grouped around the kinds of properties uh, they can measure. The first are those that allow us to understand properties of the local service, which include cameras and spectrometers, many developed from orbital missions, portable or rover mountable in many cases, They're capable of providing photogeological, geochemical, physical, and volatile data discreetly, that means for individual rocks or regolith, and contextually for the surrounding landscape. And they include some of the ones listed here. Birches, which is now flying on Lunar Ice Cube, which is an infrared point spectrometer, which is designed to be able to look at water features as a function of time of day from orbit. Nervous, which will be on Viper, a, an infrared uh, spectrometer combined with thermal and, uh, and visible spectrometers, which is designed to uh, provide information uh, below the rover on the geological properties, mineralogical properties of the regolith, and uh, specifically to look for water features, therefore to look for ice because it'll be looking in some of these colder polar permanently shadowed areas. Silver, which is designed as an entire package with an extremely broad field of view because it has a, a gimbal and it's specifically designed to look for absorption features in the infrared related to water as well as olivine to help to finally determine the difference between hydroxyl and water, which will greatly improve our ability to understand the water cycle on the moon. And finally, EECAM, and um, 
the cameras that are derived from it, um, which is basically a rover mountable camera. And depending on the field of view and filters and wavelength range you're looking at, it's possible for it to provide a lot of contextual information on the surrounding area. Multispectral microimager under development could be a very useful instrument uh, on a rover arm or handheld uh, in order to characterize the uh, petrography at the microtextural scale of uh, individual grains on a rock or regolith particles and provide compositional information through the use of color as well as morphology to reveal the origin and history of a particular sample. And it's under development somewhere between TRL4 and 6. Uh, it would be extremely useful for future use. The in situ environmental instruments, typically very compact, would help to establish the relationship between the exosphere, the regolith, and the surrounding plasma environment. Network stations of these instruments, instrument suites, or mobile payloads, instrument suites would allow capture of environmentally or human activity induced spatial and temporal variations in the surrounding environment. And these include a compact version of a mass spectrometer, also extremely sensitive, the lunar CubeSat mass spectrometer being developed at Jeff Propulsion Laboratory, which could be used as a passive instrument or as a way of detecting volatiles that are being extracted during a drilling exercise. A compact version of the tunable laser analyzer called LIRA, which could be used to detect trace water. And compact versions of electrostatic analyzers or energetic neutral analyzers, uh, which could be used to monitor the solar wind input, um, electron generation, or neutral generation as a result of solar wind interactions. These are intrinsically very compact. And therefore, putting them together in suites would create a very compact, uh, minimal resource requiring payload. A variety of instruments could be used to characterize subsurface composition and structure, including uh, elemental or mineral abundances and volatiles, down to at least a meter below the surface. Um, these include uh, neutron spectrometer that's actually being flown on Luna map currently to detect subsurface hydrogen, uh, therefore implying water down to a depth of about a meter. Um, a new instrument being developed as part of DALI called the bulk elemental composition analyzers, which basically combines gamma ray and neutron spectrometers along with a pulse neutron generator, which allows it to determine the elemental abundances and the presence of volatiles uh, down to a depth of about a meter. The, um, and, if it, with a, and a very sensitive instrument because it does have a, its own active source, a neutron generator. Uh, ground penetrating radar, there's a miniaturized version being developed at JPL, which can be used to detect variations in dielectric constant as a function of depth. Uh, very much related variations in dielectric constant to the abundance of water, and thus provides great complementarity to an instrument such as the neutron spectrometer that's looking for hydrogen and allows will allow characterization with a vertical resolution of about 10 centimeters, as well as the uh, UV laser-based ion trap mass spectrometer called Crater, which could be used to characterize um, metals and volatiles with a great deal of sensitivity in the surrounding environment, regolith, exposed uh, outcrops, boulders, uh, or rocks. Two instruments in particular could measure deep internal structure. Mobile platforms could enable deployment of seismometers at various locations to characterize internal structure through studying seismicity. In situ magnetometer readings could measure magnetic field variations induced by variations in the external field, the interplanetary magnetic field, or the Earth's magnetic field, if simultaneous measurements are taken by an external magnetometer. From these variations, 
the interior temperature and compositional profiles could be derived and used to model the structure and state of the core and mantle. I've included three magnetometers here. The flux gate magnetometer, around for the longest, a compact version has been flown already on Elfin. The silicon carbide magnetometer is currently under development. And the vector helium magnetometer, a version of that was designed for the Inspire payload. And then there's a seismometer, the short period seismometer portion of the seismometer that flew on InSight could also be used to look at local seismic events on the moon. We envision two different types of mobile instrument packages. One, to be on a MER type rover, a 10 to 20 kilogram package, and the other, a 5 to 10 kilogram package, to be on a smaller version of the rover. The, it would be possible to um, include in the tires of roving vehicles mechanical or electromagnetic property meters, which would help to characterize the properties of the regolith and its trafficability. We envision a mobile platform, robotic or with astronauts, which could deploy interior or environmental monitoring stations to create a spatially and temporally distributed network for monitoring the environment. Here we look at GLOWIN, a concept for monitoring the water cycle, which includes these stations, each of these stations basically, which would be deployed at a certain place, would have a way of monitoring the solar wind electrostatic analyzer, the exosphere with the mass spectrometer, and the energ energetic neutrals that are created as a result of the interaction between solar wind and regolith, and also the water in situ resulting from adsorbed water molecules or as a result of the interaction with the solar wind. We also envision a water prospector, which would be a small rover with a suite of compact instruments to look for water associated with permanently shadowed areas in polar regions. Instruments would include an IR spectrometer, such as USIS, to look for water absorption features, a neutron spectrometer, which would look for uh, variations in hydrogen uh, related to water as a function of depth down to about one meter, and a small version of a ground penetrating radar, which would use variations in dielectric constant, which it could detect with a vertical resolution of about 10 centimeters to determine the distribution of ice as a function of depth. A larger rover would allow geochemical and structural characterization of selected previously unexplored terrains, such as the volcanically complex far side basin Schrodinger with a payload such as the one shown here a camera such as EECAM, infrared spectrometer to characterize mineralogy and water absorption features such as USIS, a combined X-ray fluorescence, X-ray diffraction analyzer such as EXPLAIN currently under development to allow characterization of petrography of rocks, in other words, rock suite determination, multispectral microimager to allow characterization of the nature of the regolith, and bulk elemental composition analyzer to allow determination of elemental abundances down to a depth of about one meter. Small rovers with a suite of in situ detectors could be used to determine the nature of electromagnetic anomalies. These would include detectors with the ability to measure charged particles, the exosphere, energetic neutrals, local fields, and volatiles. A small rover with a flux gate magnetometer, an IR spectrometer such as USIS to look for volatiles, a camera such as EECAM to look at albedo differences, and detectors such as ESA, ENA, and SWEA, which can detect protons, neutrals, and electrons, could help to resolve the nature of the lunar magnetic swirl anomalies and their influence on space weathering. Magnetic swirl anomalies are the sites of local magnetic fields, and it's thought that those fields hold off the 
solar wind and therefore have a great impact on the extent to which space weathering occurs. The generic yet reconfigurable packaging under development at JPL utilizes advances in thermal and enclosure technologies to address a major challenge of small packages, particularly on the lunar surface. And that is surviving the long temperature extremes of lunar night and day, long during the night, long during the day, and very extreme. Conventional approaches require significant increases in mass and volume and a large number of batteries to survive lunar night. The idea is to minimize the need for increased mass and volume and reduce the number of batteries that are required to maintain the temperature within the enclosure. Um, high performance thermal components based packaging uh, is based on passive thermal approach and should allow at least limited duty cycle operation during lunar night and have interfaces for lander power communi and communication. Um, we're talking about details that are provided in the diagrams here for Artemis and Pallet. In summary, the instruments NASA and collaborators have been developing, combined with the high performance generic yet reconfigurable packaging for extreme environments, provide candidates for suites which could deliver focused yet high priority science measurements from mobile or stationary lunar surface platforms, as the several examples given here indicate. And by the way, I have four additional slides you can peruse at your leisure, which give references for all the material presented here.